Hello, everyone, and welcome to this um, radcast that we're doing on the topic of applying radical collective intelligence to the world's most daunting problems. And uh, it's sort of like another introduction and brainstorming session to the topic. And I want to welcome my colleague and co-host, Michael, who's in Thailand. How are you doing there, Michael? Great to see you. Good. Good to be here. Good awesome. to be here. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Great. Okay. <clears throat> so um, let's start with just kind of a, an open discussion about what radical collective intelligence fundamentally is. At its core, it is about um, mashing up or combining um, human intelligence with artificial intelligence in, spe in specific uh, ways that are designed, that are architected. In other words, not just chance interactions, but designed interactions between artificial intelligence and human intelligence um, in order to what? In order to basically, in order to solve the world's most daunting problems and return the world to the extent possible to a state of wholeness, a state of integrity. And this can happen in today's world, and it can also happen in a much hotter world, which it looks like we're headed towards. Um, and uh, so, we're going to we're going to we're going to look at that and look at you know what we should be focusing on first, second, third, and uh, we're going to see how we use uh, radical collective intelligence to um, address both the overheating of the planet and also re restoring the planet to integrity or wholeness, regardless of what the temperature is. Um, and that sounds like a tall order and it really is, but it's not, a, it's, uh, but it's something that radical collective intelligence will be able to do um, quite effectively, we believe. And so this introduction is to show you how that is. And uh, we'll also look at, uh, solving people problems with radical collective intelligence, namely uh, world hunger. So, um, so the first thing I want to do is start with um, an important component or building block of radical collective intelligence, and that is the the concept and the methodology of brain swarming, as uh, shown by Dr. Tony McCaffrey in this Harvard Business Review uh, video that I'm about to show an excerpt of, okay? This is the methodology of brain swarming. And um, what there is to look out for here is how this is a, uh, a, a process for generating ideas and specifically generating solutions to a specific problem that you're about to see. And this will run for about a minute and a half. Here it goes. In a brain swarming graph, the goal grows downward into refined sub goals. Resources are interacted together and grow upward. When the two directions connect, solutions start to emerge. Let's see how brainstorming would handle a classic management problem like this real life conundrum at the company Pacific Power and Light. Winter storms in the Cascade Mountains leave power lines loaded with ice, which if left unattended will break the lines. Having workers climb the poles to shake the lines is both dangerous and time consuming. Management searched for a better method for years. What if they had used brainstorming? To start, they would simply place the goal at the top of the brain swarming graph and a few known resources at the bottom. Then the group would be instructed not to talk, but to simply add post-it notes and drawn lines to the graph. People who are naturally top-down thinkers would start refining the goal. Other naturally bottom-up thinkers would analyze how the resources could be used or they would add new resources. Pretty soon, the two directions would connect, an indication that the group is finding ways to use the resources to solve the problem. This figure shows a careful refinement of the goal, as well as Pacific Power and Light's actual solution of using the helicopter's downdraft 
shake the lines enough to remove the ice. Other solutions are also shown, including using a helicopter to drop a de-icing agent onto the lines and using the conducted electricity to generate enough heat to melt the ice on the outside of the lines. We don't know. Okay, so that uh, is the introduction I wanted to give you to this methodology called brainstorming, which is very powerful. It's one important part of, but by no means the, the whole of um, radical collective intelligence. So um, there are, just to kind of, I want to kind of quickly introduce the, the, the big idea of radical collective intelligence uh, and how brainstorming fits into it. Um, I want to do that just kind of at a basic high level. And then what I want to do is, is for us to roll up our sleeves and actually go through a couple of examples of how we can use radical collective intelligence, how radical collective intelligence uh, might be applied uh, to solving some, some specific problems. So the big idea of radical collective intelligence is this, that there's three main ingredients that go into creating this exotic mashup uh, between um, uh, human and in, human intelligence and artificial intelligence. The the first uh, key ingredient is to bring human beings together uh, so that they're collaborating um, in in the spirit of you know more heads think better than one. Uh, that's it. Just bring people together. And the way that people will be able to express their collective human intelligence towards solving problems is through conversation, right? Um, I'm, it, it may, this may be just be totally obvious to everyone. <laughs> and if so, that's a good thing. But just to make the point that um, as no matter how many thousands of years we go back in history, the fundamental way that people solve really big uh, existential challenges, um, whether we were cavemen trying to survive from the saber-toothed tiger or whatever, um, or surviving the ice age or droughts or famines or whatever, um, is we would come together typically around a campfire and we would talk about the predicament we're in, the, problem, the problems we need to solve. And in conversation, we, that's how really we would leverage our collective intelligence. Again, sounds obvious, and if it does, that's a good thing. Um, and that's the first ingredient, is just bringing people together to have conversations. The second big ingredient is um, essentially, how do we extract the most information possible um, from these conversations? And the answer is the first part of the, the well, there's, it's actually a multi-step process, but the first step is to record the conversation, right? And the richest way to do that is to record both the audio and the video. Um, and there's a lot of reasons to record the video and we'll get to some of those, but let's go to the simpler of the two streams, which is audio. And um, we take the recorded audio transcribe it using artificial intelligence, you know, voice recognition uh, software to transcribe it from audio to text. Okay, so that's the next stage is transcription. Um, we then take that transcribed text and index it. What does Google do? The Google search engine, it indexes the entire web. So uh, likewise, uh, we index the text. Um, and then the next stage is we take that indexed text and we map it to uh, a to taxonomies of topics, and the most important taxonomies are those of the world's needs. What are the needs of a whole world? Um, and we'll we'll get to that. In fact, let's just get to that right now. Um, Okay.
what are the needs of a whole world? What, what does our world need in order to be whole? Um, well, we need for people to be whole and we need for the planet to be whole, all the ecosystems and life supporting systems. And so for people to be whole, that means their physical needs need to be met and then their higher needs need to be met, ideally. Um, and wholeness for the planet means the air needs to be whole, the water, the land needs to be whole, the ecosystems, the species, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what we mean by a taxonomy. And then of course it goes deeper and deeper and deeper from there. Um, so, Radical collective intelligence, the second in ingredient, like I, um, as I was saying, is extracting information. So just to review really quickly, we take the conversations, record them, transcribe them to text, index the transcriptions, and then map those that indexing of the conversation to specific topics in this taxonomy, the taxonomy of the needs of a whole world, as well as uh, taxonomies of solutions to um, the world's problems, um, and we'll look at we'll we'll look at some specific taxonomies of those uh, in a little bit. Hey, Jamie. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, do you have any visuals, or uh, could you come up with one to show how Tim uh, works? Um, you know, with an example, or, or, or are we going to come to that? Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to come to that. We're going to come to that. Um, but, uh, um, but I'll, I'll sketch, I'll sketch that out. You're, you're talking about the, the second ingredient, which is Tim, right? Yes. Okay. Let me, let me just uh, debug what that's all about uh, in a moment here. Okay. So what Michael is saying is, so here, let me let me just uh, sketch out what we're talking about. So ingredients, the three main ingredients of radical collective intelligence. The first is you know just people coming together, right? Groups of people coming together and having conversations, right? The second is. Uh, we use the acronym TIM, which stands for transcription into text, indexing of the conversation, and then mapping of the, basically the parts of the conversation to um, uh, taxonomies. And, and we were just taking, a, we were just looking at um, the taxonomy of uh, the world's needs, um, the needs of a whole world. And it just occurred to me that we've actually got an example of a taxonomy of uh, solutions right here in what we were just watching, right? So basically the things that light up in this video are uh, solutions. So you see, you know, here, helicopter to make strong wind, boom. That's a solution, that whole chain that just lit up there. Here, I'm gonna rewind. You gotta watch for it. Okay, watch what lights up here. Helicopter, make strong wind, strong wind, shake lines. That line there, that whole chain is a solution. What's the solution? Helicopter makes strong wind, <laughs> strong. <laughs> um, let's, it's, it's better to go the other way around. So the goal is to remove ice from power lines, right? Um, these three orange boxes at the top are the three different ways. Uh, Dr. McCaffrey calls these um, sub goals and I take exception to that. I think that's a confusing term, potentially confusing terminology. So I call these ways. These are ways in which we can achieve that goal. Um, a sub goal kind of makes it sound like it could just be a partial part of the goal. No, it's a way to achieve the goal a hundred percent. So if this, if these three are ways, I call it every, this next layer underneath, I call them subways, <laughs> right? They're specific ways, um, in which you could, you could achieve that. 
and here you could actually you know use actual use different combinations of these for that matter you could use different combinations of these different ways um, and then I call these sub subways um, these ones below here but and then the resources are applied to affect or um, deliver upon these ways actually happening uh, to shake the, you know, in this case, make, helicopter is used, that's the resource, is used to make a strong wind, that's the sub-subway. Uh, strong wind is the subway and shake lines is the way and remove ice from power lines is always the goal, a singular goal, N note that. Okay, so why am I, so where's the taxonomy? The taxonomy, so that whole chain from helicopter through shake lines is a solution um, and that's part of the taxonomy of solutions. Look, let's look for let's look for the others that appear here. Watch for it. Boom. Okay, what lit up? Here, it's two different resources that are being used: helicopter and de-icing agent. Uh, the helicopter is being now used in a totally different capacity. It's not being used to make strong wind. It's being used, if anything, to make as little wind as possible while it drops de-icer onto the power lines. Uh, to melt the ice that's already there? No, to prevent ice from forming in the first place. That's the way that you achieve the goal of removing ice from power lines, make it so that it never even exists at all, right? Hold kind of a little bit of a different paradigm. Okay, so that this whole chain, right? It looks like a stick figure that's breakdancing, you know, two legs and a you know what. Um, that whole stick figure, uh, all the way up to prevent ice from forming, that's a solution right, to meeting this need. Okay, so that's another one for the taxonomy. Now look for the third. Watch for it. Bing, you see that light up over there on the right? That's the resources extra wire. The sub subway is carry electricity to the outside of the line. The subway is heat the outside of the lines. And the way is to warm the lines. And the goal is always the same. All right. Okay. So that's an example of a taxonomy of solutions to a specific problem, right? So um, back to the big picture. Um, the mapping is, of course, the, the kind of the newest, um, you know, I mean, there's, you know, software has been around for literally decades to do voice transcription. Indexing has been around for over 20 years. Um, and so those are nothing new. Mapping to taxonomies, that is, I'll draw it in red like a big marketing slogan, that is new, <laughs> right? So that's really the first new, new, new thing that we're actually introducing um, that's different from, say, what uh, Google Plus transcription can do. All right, and uh, as far as, uh, and this turns out to be quite profound, especially in the face of the third ingredient, which we have a different acronym for, which is AIMY, which is my artificial intelligence, but we use the acronym Amy. All right, we like to kind of personify these. So you've got Tim and Amy. So if Tim does transcription indexing and mapping, what does Amy do? Amy is, um, the uh, artificial intelligence, think of, think of her like an executive assistant. And what she does is she makes connections. You know, I, I personally makes find uh, this may not be the best time to make this point, but Amy confusing because, and I, and I was confused by this the first time I, I heard it, <clears throat> because Tim's a um, an acronym, and so when it comes to Amy, my mind starts oh, yeah, you're, looking you're right. for the okay. acronym. Yeah, totally, totally. Okay, so let's let let's note that as an issue. This is a bad a bad choice of a name for that reason. It's confusing, and we'll we'll come back uh, and we'll bring the name doctor in to fix that later. But for now, let's just go with it. Is that fair? Totally. Okay. Um, all right, so Amy makes connections. What kind of connections? Um, so, and here's where we really get to the heart of it. And uh, again, let's go back to the, um, the de-icing example, just because it's, we've got really great graphics for it, and these are 
you know, really, you know, just great. It's just a great example. It's really easy to comprehend. Um, so let's, let's go back a ways, right. To as they're kind of fleshing out, um, you know, let's say that the ways have been, have been thought up and some resources have been identified, but that's it, right? Let's say, in other words, let's say that a bunch that some conversations have been having been had about the general problem about ice removing ice from power, why it's a problem, you know, why not just leave the ice there, you know, and then okay, it's a problem. Okay, great. And then other conversations, maybe like brainstorming sessions about, hey, how do we shake the lines, right? Um, hey, what about preventing the ice from forming in the first place? Hey, what about warming line and melting the ice off? That's kind of more elegant. Um, you know, and then other conversations about these different subways, right? Okay. And then other conversations about each of these resources, but no specific conversations about actually closing the gap, right? Now, um, at this point, uh, what, what, you know, a number of things could happen. But let's say that Amy were to step in at this point. What she might do is, um, you know, for each of these resources, uh, do basically a, uh, a scan, uh, you know, a deep search kind of ontological to find out, you know, what does each of these resources actually do, right? Like fire, obviously, it generates heat. Poles can be used to make contact with things that are far away, like power lines you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then she might be able to make connections between these resources and these subways, right? You know, like, for example, she might make the connection. Well, you know, if strong wind is a subway and fan creates wind, then, hey, here's kind of an obvious connection, right? So she then might connect the people who are talking about applying fans to the problem to the people who are analyzing it from you know, a subway standpoint, strong wind, and say, hey, you guys should talk to each other, right? Now, that's a really kind of basic sort of obvious one. Um, but, yeah. But, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, yeah, the more basic, the better, I think, as an introductory example. Um, I would not call it ontological, but... Okay, okay. Um, but I think that these... I, I think that the AI is... Uh, potentially involved uh, if you go back to Tim in the mapping yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe not maybe not initially it, it's kind of like Amy is a is 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 a subset of of, of mapping or like a, of what you know, be, um, oh, a subset it, of mapping a subset of mapping. yeah be, yeah because um, you know the mapping could just consist of um, organizing things topically, right, which doesn't take AI to do, you know, mm. this is range under this or that topic, mm. right, but all of these connections are a part of that mapping. Um, I, I, uh, as I yeah, see yeah, it, yeah, yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're right in the bigger sense. What I'm using, I was using mapping as a very, in a very specific sense of, um, here, I'll just kind of show it graphically. Um, what do we mean by mapping as part of Tim? So what we mean is, um, so you've got all this text that happened in the conversation. You know, Bob said this, Mary said that, da, 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 da. So you got all this text. And then over here, you've got, you know, a taxonomy of, say, you know, whole world, right? Which breaks into people and planet and you know goes from there right this kind of mapping that i'm talking about basically says all right let's go piece by piece throughout the uh you know the conversation let's see these these first sentences up to here those map to um you know this whole whoops sorry uh this whole chunk maps precisely to boop, right here you know this um this portion of the taxonomy right and then you know likewise you know maybe this other chunk down here uh maps to uh this other portion of the taxonomy right 
And then, um, you know, and so on and so on. That's what we mean by, that's what I meant by mapping. So it's something very definite. It's, it's, it's mappings of things that already exist uh, versus connections that don't actually exist yet. But I actually get your point, Michael, because um, these blue line connections that I just drew, they didn't connect until Tim made them, you know, connect. Yeah, and it's not a, it's not a criticism. Um, in yeah. fact, I think it's a logical extension of, of the mapping. Gotcha, gotcha. But, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, let's, let's let time tell whether we should include them both under the name mapping. Um, but let me, let me just be clear what I mean by the connections that Amy will make um, different from the mappings that Tim makes, okay? So here, um, you know, let's just say you've got um, a, a specific problem like ending world hunger, right? And that's your, that's your goal, right? Um, and let's say that you had, um, uh, you know, three ways of doing that. One is helping people grow their own food. Another is um, uh, donating food to those who are hungry. And another is, you know, give people jobs kind of thing. All right. All right. Um, and then let's say that, um, let's just take donations, for example, for starters, uh, as maybe perhaps the most urgent, but long-term uh, not sustainable. But the point there of the urgency is that, you know, it may take a year before the first crops would be ready if you help them grow the food, but how many people would drop dead or get brain damage from starvation during that year? Um, likewise with jobs. So donation for those who just need it right now, let's, let's just donate first and then we'll figure out the rest later. That's kind of how I see it. But anyway, and then let's say there's different ways of achieving those kinds of donations. And then uh, down here in the realm of resources, right? Let's just say that to, I'm just going to represent it just kind of like a, like a flat matrix, right? That there's just all these different kinds of resources, right, available in the world. And, you know, what if there were a way to you know connect different resources together and you know make um i'll just call this an assembly of of um resources you know that are assembled in a certain way i'll just use the letter a for that um so you have got another assembly of resources here and then even those assemblies can be put together um, to make yet another assembly, right? A more complex assembly. But anyway, bottom line, all these resources connect together to achieve, um, you know, all the funding needed to buy all the food, to donate all the food and, and hunger, right? So, you know, that this pathway, including all these resources here, here, and here, combined to that, dot, 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 this whole illuminated pathway uh, is what would end hunger. That's the solution. Okay. Um, but let's say that that had not yet been figured out, okay? And um, all that had been figured out is that certain resources had been identified and some of those resources had been assembled into an assembly. Others had not. But, so I'm just going to highlight now actual conversations uh, in green. Here's a conversation about this assembly of resources. This other one in green is about the idea of creating an assembly of resources, but you don't even know which resources yet, right? So I'm just going to represent this here as kind of like, you know, question marks, right? And then... Um, up here, there have been conversations about helping people grow their own food, helping people get jobs, other conversations about hunger as a world problem, how big is the problem, where is the problem, you know, what's the cause, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there have been some conversations about donations, but that's it. Now, 
what are the connections that we'd be looking at? I'll represent these in, in gold, connections and gold. Connections might be like Amy might say, hey, you know, I've seen um, these resources that you guys are talking about in this assembly and this other assembly here. I've seen, you know, other similar assemblages of resources being applied to uh, round up donations to be able to, you know, for, for different causes. Why don't you guys talk to each other? You know, and then the people who are having the conversation about donations go, huh? What? Talk to who? Huh? huh? Uh, to these people, to the assembly people. And the assembly people say, huh? 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 And then, and then these other, like everyone's notified and they're like, huh? huh, huh. And then uh, Amy says, look, uh, why don't you guys talk to each other? We've, I've looked at your calendar. Like, remember, Amy is like a super efficient executive assistant. I've looked at all your calendars and here's the next day and time when all of you are, would be available to meet. Here's the goal. Get together and see if you can bridge this gap see if you can fill in a if you can create a conversation that i'm now putting in green here right this big sort of connecting tissue have a conversation about that connective tissue see if you can put it together right and so let me just give kind of like a real life example of that 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 um michael and i have worked together on with uh, a number of other colleagues um over the over the years and that is um putting together different resources. So one resource is a new standard uh, called, cert called Triple C, Certified Compassionate Companies, which donates all of its profits to eradicating hunger, among other good things. Kind of like Newman's Own, except um, Newman's Own is a brand. Triple C would be a standard under which you could have, you know, multiple brands. Uh, brands uh, such as Sato Hemp. This is the first Triple C brand. And though they donate, and it's headed by my brother Takuya Sato, who leads the hemp industry in Japan. He is the Hemperer of Japan. So uh, Hemperer Sato um, signed up his company to be the first Triple C company. So they donate all their profits to Ending Hunger. And those profits go to programs such as the community cafes. Um, which we have been pioneering in Southern California, uh, in the Mojave Desert, um, in some communities that suffer from hunger and uh, with, with very extremely good results. Um, and we took those resources, right? So now we're looking at a standard, right? An international standard, a brand, uh, a fiber, hemp, a crop, hemp, um, a legacy, the, the Sato, the Sato family, the Sato family in Japan has the oldest legacy of hemp in the world, going back like many, like, like over, over a dozen generations. Um, and that, that they passed on the knowledge from father to son, father to son, without skipping a single generation on how to grow and process hemp. So that's a legacy, a brand, a crop, a business model, a community cafe, all those come together in a strategy called the Hungerless Games, where um, people buy products such as Sato Hemp that are certified compassionate, knowing that all profits go to end hunger, more community cafes are built and supplied, and people see hunger being eradicated. We could eradicate hunger in Haiti very quickly using this model. Uh, once, we get enough, once we get enough funding from enough people uh, buying enough Triple C products and services, um, that we stoke a virtuous cycle that just goes and goes and goes and goes. It's a feel-good story. More and more people find out about it. Me news media wants to report on it um, because the oligarchs who own the media outlets um, help promote a story that things are getting better and, you know, for the most going to sell more than whatever. Anyway, it, it just becomes a nice virtuous cycle. Um, I'm going to stop screen sharing for a moment and go to Michael. Uh, what, yeah. what you, you know, what, what, one of the things that just uh, occurred to me uh, uh, was how such things as stories, right, or narrative um, is a part of the, the problem uh, solving. Yeah. It's, I mean, solving a problem is itself a story, but... Um, just as Tony McCaffrey's example, 
shows us, and as he tells us explicitly, it's like leaving signals, right, for ants that will influence others who are That's working right. on That's whatever right. set of problems. Yeah. Right? Those signals, that signaling uh, can come in the form of stories. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we're dealing with something here where uh, we're dealing with something where the resources um, can even include such things um, as stories or coming yeah. up with a, a new story or narrative. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. Um, and uh, in fact, that was really at the heart of a lot of what we just put on the screen, which of course you contributed to mightily. Um, and uh, as has, uh, Sat you know, Takuya Sato, Sato Hemp, uh, their whole organization and many others. So, um, but, you know, and, and our point there, of course, is um, just to go back to screen share. Yeah, and a brand like Sato Hemp itself tells a story. There you go. Exactly, exactly. So it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's stories all over this whole story. <laughs> um, and in fact, it was because of the, of the, the really rich symbioses that we had uh, working with um, uh, the Sato Hemp organization and uh, and folks that they introduced us with that we that we we really helped patch up um, like here we are like a a big um, retreat that uh, we had radish and sato hemp we all got together at the base of Mount Fuji in Japan and had this awesome retreat and we took this photograph to to kind of symbolize you know the putting of heads together that more heads think better than than one. Um, and, uh, of course we've done a lot of the development of the concept of radical collective intelligence, uh, with the Satos. So, um, but anyway, yeah, story, story, story. This is all story. It's all story. And, um, that's probably the, the most powerful resource of all is the story. Yeah. That because the narrative, the narrative drives it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. So, um, so back here, you know, where, whereas I was saying that, um, you know, oh, you know, uh, so, so that's a, just a great example. There's, there's a bunch of these resources that were, you know, that get assembled together that ultimately result in voila, the, the funding happening to end hunger. Right. So anyway, that's just a, yeah. A, the, these these people use these resources or a set of resources to solve, you know, these problems. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's so that, it's in, in in a sense, it's that simple. It's just that the mapping function and the AI, you know, pattern recognition and, um, and so on and so forth uh, is is what makes a lot of this visible, you know, identifying the lacunas, for example, the, the lacunae or gaps, for example. Yeah. Um, is just, is, you know, humans are great at telling stories, um, but what, what we're not so good at, of course, um, is being able to handle uh, all of these data sets and finding patterns um, and showing where there are, are both connections and, and, and missing connections right 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 yeah you know in in fact um you know like if, if we go back to uh before those blanks were filled in by amy and there were just all these disparate conversations on these disparate topics you know the first assembly to the left the other assembly to the right donations above grow food jobs hunger etc like um Amy may draw upon, for example, you know, Newman's Own, which was, which is a brand, a powerful brand that assembled um, some principles and values together that resulted in a bunch of donations. And maybe, maybe it was that example and the pattern matching between the Newman's Own example and the Triple C, you know, you know the story, uh, the, um, uh, the philanthropic, 
um, uh, angle, um, it, you know, the, the diversion of profits from normally going to the bank accounts of the wealthy. Now we're going to, you know, feed the hungry or, or whatever charities uh, Newman's own uh, donates to. I know they donate to a lot of charities. So anyway, that, that's just a, that's just an example of how uh, Amy might have come up with this connection. But she would she might also come up with other possible connections over here and other ones over here that may turn out to be total duds, right? And um, so really, what distinguishes the connections that Amy makes? They're not they're not really they're they're, they're the, the key the key missing word is they are suggested suggested connections right that's the key and you know whereas with tim um these are actual uh connections what what they're talking about here is this or maps to that that's that's a reality that's you know that's always going to look like this it's never going to look like that all <laughs> right that's the difference um between mapping and suggested connections, which is what Amy does. But they're, I mean, they're equally important in the big picture. Let's go back to the big picture. Um, you have conversations, you have Tim transcri transcribing, transcription, indexing, and mapping of the conversations to taxonomies. Amy basically analyzing um, all of these uh, mappings of taxonomies and constantly looking to close the gap between taxonomies of uh, needs, such as ending world hunger, and uh, taxonomies of uh, resources, which you see down here, okay? Amy is constantly seeking to close the gap. Hey, what about this? Hey, what about that? Hey, what about, uh, she'll constantly be using, uh, well, I mean, well, there's a whole topic of how she is really crucial to, to all this, as you might imagine. Um, but that's a bit beyond the scope of this introduction. Um, yeah, and, and, and I'd like to just make a high level point yeah. here. Yeah. Um, and I think it'll come up again later when we talk about, you know, uh, the optimization layer. Um, and that's simply... Uh, Simply put, this involves a whole transformation, right? Uh, because instead of, you know, individual interests being expressed, right? I'm solving this problem with this product or whatever. All right, here we have somebody uh, joining us. Oh, in. Miles. Hey, how you doing, Miles? Miles is joining us from Calgary in Alberta, Canada, and Good. he's joined us twice before on video conferences. I'm very happy to see you, Miles. Miles, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Michael, who's in Thailand. So this is now a truly international conference. We've got Canada, the United States, and Thailand represented. How are you doing there, Miles? I'm fine, thank you. How's the sound? Sounds great. Sounds great to me. Michael, how does that sound to you? Great. Good to, good to meet you, Miles. Hi, Michael. Nice to meet you, too. So I just happened to wake up and uh, I thought, OK, I'll just turn on the iPad and iPad. And I saw that you were on. So I thought, OK, I'll pop in here. So I'm uh, I'm half awake, but it's good to be here. Well, you know, it, it's I'm really, really glad you're here for a number of reasons, not the least of which is this is radical collective intelligence in action and michael taught me uh, the nifty expression why tell them when you can show them so here we are talking about collective intelligence and now boop, you know miles pops in and just to bring it back to what we were talking about with amy um amy might have made a suggestion a su suggested connection that miles join us on this conversation to help us you know, get the ball through the end, through the goalposts, right? Um, that's collective intelligence in action. And um, I'm sure Miles will help us. And in fact, um, uh, I've got a lot to say, but the idea is to just percolating. Um, now, because we're recording and broadcasting this, 
Um, I just want to do a super brief recap for both for you, Miles, and for the rest of our audience, because some people might have just started viewing this only recently. Um, and uh, I also want to extend the invitation for, for others to join. Um, you can find the link to join if you want to just jump in with us and literally make history here with us. Um, be part of the collective intelligence. Look for the link uh, in a post on this same YouTube channel, right? Look for a, a video I posted a, a little over 24 hours ago, which is a four minute video and contains the link to join, actually join this uh, particular video conference that we're doing right now. Uh, another place you'll find it is on my Google Plus page. You'll also find it on my Facebook page. So, um, it worked for Miles, it'll work for you too. <laughs> All right, that's my sales pitch. Um, I'm gonna go on mute for, for a few moments and just let you gentlemen weigh in with anything you'd like to say before we do the recap of what, you know, of this, it's basically a new introduction of radical collective intelligence applied both to ending world hunger, to cooling the planet, to any problem you can imagine, and we're just kind of going through different examples. We'll recap in a moment, but I'm gonna go on mute first. Well, I will just uh, say that maybe if we have time, uh, I would like to talk about what is one of the deepest problems, I think, in, in that it's something an American philosopher, Sheldon Woolen, describes, and that is... Um, the biggest threat to our civilization is our passivity, being passive rather than active. Uh, he's unfortunately just recently passed away. He was about some 94 years old. I forget which university down there that he lectured at, but he's a fascinating man in that uh, he had been active, I believe, in World War II, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so anyway, a, a military man who then went in to study sociology and uh, became a prominent intellectual down there. And he's uh, there's a fantastic um, interview done by Chris Hedges with him. So anyway, at some point, maybe we can talk a little bit about passivity. How do we get people activated? Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, um, well, I've got some definite ideas for that. And in fact, um, some of those will pop out in the examples that we that we show here. But first, let me, um, uh, let me just give a broad overview of, uh, what we've been reviewing up until now. We've been uh, discussing an, a kind of a, uh, an introduction to what is radical collective intelligence, the three ingredients. The first ingredient is just bringing people together so that they can have conversations. The second ingredient is we use the acronym TIM, um, which we, what do we do to extract maximum informational and knowledge value from those conversations? Number one, we record them, then we apply TIM. Transcription, transcribing the conversations into text, indexing the text, and then mapping that text to uh, taxonomies. Taxon <coughs> Excuse me, the taxonomies of the, a taxonomy, for example, taxonomy of the needs of a whole world, taxonomies of solutions, taxonomies of problems, uh, multiple different kinds of taxonomies. When that mapping is done, then it's kind of like we know what people are talking about. And seeing what topics people are talking about, um, the next ingredient of radical collective intelligence, which we use as the non-acronym AMI, <laughs> but it, uh, if it were an acronym, it would stand for artificial intelligence and then my artificial intelligence. Um, but MY doesn't stand for anything. What Amy does is makes makes suggested connections, and uh, it's really those suggested connections that ultimately lead to closing the gaps between uh, needs and solutions. So, with that in mind, um, I'd like to move on to 
a concrete example that we can start out fresh in. So Michael and I haven't even, we haven't even talked about this yet. So this, we're breaking fresh new ground here, uh, Miles and Michael. Um, and that is, how do we apply, um, well, actually, let me, before we even get to the next example, let me um, first talk about how in the case of a whole world, let me just show here uh, what we were looking at a minute ago, which is this taxonomy right here, okay? Um, the taxonomy of a whole world, the needs of a whole world. We have needs for people and needs for the planet. Um, we have we talked about ending world hunger using collective intelligence and gave some specific examples. Um, next, we're going to talk about um, addressing uh, abrupt climate change, which is arguably the I wouldn't just say arguably it is the most urgent problem uh, facing all of Mother Earth, not just humanity, but all ecosystems and species. Um, and the most urgent, you see, why did we focus on ending hunger over here for wholeness for people? It's the most urgent of all these. Uh, people need to eat, absolutely urgent, basic. Eat and drink, so so clean water goes, goes with it. Um, meanwhile, over here for wholeness for the planet, the most urgent thing we need to do immediately is cool the planet and um, prevent it from uh, the runaway heating that it's right now just on the precipice of. So um, so we're basically picking the most urgent need from here and the most urgent need from here and drilling in on those as examples. We've already done hunger. Um, now, uh, and, and just, just to show you real quick, Miles, uh, we talked about the standard triple C certified compassionate companies, which donate all their profits to ending hunger. We use those profits in programs like community cafes to feed people for free, nutritious foods for free, also creating jobs and volunteer opportunities. This is part of a broad strategy called the Hungerless Games, where certified compassion companies fund community cafes and other uh, programs to end hunger. That creates a global movement. It's a great story. It's a feel-good story, 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 story. And uh, the very first compassionate company is Sato Hemp of, of Japan. Um, anyway, that's the example. Those are the examples of different resources, different assets being uh, used together in combination, assembled together in, in order to achieve the goal of ending hunger. Okay. So in the case of, now let's turn to the case of cooling the planet, right? Cooling planet earth okay so if that's the goal right now let's let's use um uh the brain swarming uh example we also showed a video of brain swarming um have you seen that miles brain swarming i did see you talk about it in the previous video but okay uh, great okay Okay, very good. So that, yeah, we just gave a very, very brief introduction to that. So you're up to speed on that. So how are we gonna cool the planet? Um, there's, there's really um, two big levers for that. One is, um, I'm just gonna call it greenhouse uh, gas um, management, for lack of a better word, solutions. That, this is one way of cooling the planet. And then another another way of cooling the planet, of course, the, the two actually work hand in hand, um, is I'm just going to call it um, uh, very simply radiation management. That's This is really the key to preventing um, planet Earth from overheating and also um, cooling it. Um, and... This applies to both, um, you know, incoming solar uh, radiation as well as uh, infrared, which is reflect, which is emitted from the Earth back into space. And in fact, it's well. Here, let me just do a quick sketch of of the basics of that on the next one here. 
So here you've got planet Earth. Um, here you've got the sun. Sunlight comes in. We've got uh, these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. By the way, I'm going to ask both of you guys to please mute. Please mute your microphone when you're not talking. Sorry, guys. Oh, no problem. No problem. Okay. So, uh, thank you. So, we got solar radiation coming in, passes through the greenhouse gases, and then infrared radiation is re emitted from the Earth, gets partially trapped and reflected back from the greenhouse gases. And that's the main driver of overheating. Um, that has been the main driver of overheating for, of the planet so far. Um, there is uh, a new dark horse that's coming in that's actually going to give us the single biggest spike uh, over time ever. And that's this other effect. And that is the melting of the Arctic ice. So imagine that um, <clears throat> just very simplistically, we've got this. Actually, I don't know. I don't know draw the rest black, let me just draw the rest as blue for ocean, and then maybe, I don't know, green for some continents or something like that. Okay, <clears throat> so um, you got blue ocean, green continents, they're really not green, they're all different colors. But on the North Pole, you've got this Arctic ice cap, and that has had uh, the effect um, ever since humans have been on the planet and long before that, of sunlight that would come in, especially during the summer months and hit the North Pole, um, would most of it would get reflected back to space, right? And um, <clears throat> as opposed to sunlight hitting the ocean that would get absorbed by the ocean because it's dark, right? So the, so the, the Arctic ice acts like a giant mirror and so the predicament that we're in right now is that we keep melting and melting and melting away the arctic ice and the melting of the arctic ice is actually a deceptively vicious problem and that um you know it, there used to be quite a thick layer now we're looking at it just just horizontally um not not like in the globe view anymore so there used to be a it used to be quite thick right and have a substantial surface area and what's happened is that the area has has decreased uh significantly but very importantly the thickness it's gotten way thinner right and so now with the warm temperatures of the arctic we may have an Ar ice free arctic this summer or it may be next summer but it's coming and when and when we have an ice free Arctic, when all that the last of the Arctic ice melts, and it's blue ocean up here, it's going to be absorbing. There's it's no longer sunlight is no longer going to be reflected back into space. It's going to be absorbed, and the planet is going to heat up like crazy. This will be the single biggest spike um, of heating to the planet ever in a you know in a in a few year period. And of course, with that overheating, particularly in the Arctic region, um, that overheating is going to release gobs of the trapped methane that's been tra trapped in the Arctic for um, I don't know how many millions of years. And then, of course, that's going to drive another a whole other cycle of heating um, from the methane. Um, and 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 then you know, you, uh, Professor Guy McPherson has identified no fewer than I believe 67 at last forcing feedback loops. And the, and the thing is we've been m most, these, these have all been operating, but they, but most of them haven't really kicked into high gear yet. The melting of the Arctic ice has kicked into high gear and that's what makes it the most urgent thing. So how are we going to melt the Arctic ice? Um, the first thing I want to point out is the melting of Arctic ice is a subset of radiation management because everything I just talked about was all about radiation, reflecting it back into space, namely. So part of the radiation management strategy has to be um, ice reflectivity. And specifically, um, 
preserving, right? Preserving Arctic ice. Preserving it and in fact, an, another, in addition to preserving what's there, we need to refreeze what's been lost, right? Refreeze lost Arctic ice so that we actually reverse the trend of melting of Arctic ice, right? So these are all different ways and subways and sub subways of, of cooling the planet. Um, other ways of doing uh, radiation management include, um, you know, thin film reflective materials, right? Let's talk about that for a moment. Thin film reflective materials. So just imagine that um, we were to, you know, let's say in a por on a portion of the planet, um, we were to suspend huge sheets of thin film reflective material, either supported by, you know, blimps, dirigibles, as many people call them, um, and or supported by, you know, big structures like uh, towers to support them, whatever. But basically, just forcibly uh, reflect away the sunlight, right? So you got thin film reflective materials, other ways of achieving it, of, of achieving increased reflectivity literally includes spraying ocean water into the air, creating uh, clouds. Clouds are white. Uh, white is a great color for reflecting sunlight away, right? So um, there's lots of ways that we can do uh, solar radiation management. Okay, lots of different strategies. I'll just draw all these little boxes to represent that. Lots and lots of different ways to do that. So this is now a taxonomy of starting from a need, cooling the planet. Um, what are some ways in which we can achieve that? And then what are some sub ways in which we can achieve that? And then in some cases, even sub sub ways of achieving that. Okay, great. Um, so then <clears throat> let's look at if, so if those are the needs, again, the generate with the need, we look at ways to fill that need. And then we look at even more specific ways and we keep rooting down. And then at the bottom, the bottoms up half of the solution is looking at resources, right? What resources do we have? How can they be combined in different ways? And how can these different combinations of resources, you know, meet up with one of these specific pathways to ultimately meet the need, right? Um, so, you know, what resources do we have to, um, you know, to, to, to refreeze uh, the Arctic ice or in, in general to, to, um, to reflect away radiation um, as well as to uh, sequester uh, carbon and other greenhouse gases. Well, we have, you know, we have ships, um, we have, you know, ships, we have pumps, like for spraying uh, ocean water into the air. Um, we have, we have thin film reflective materials, right? Um, we have, you know, blimps, dirigibles, as some folks call them. Um, we have, um, let's see, uh, we have certain other particulates which can be used to reflect uh, sunlight away. Um, we have the means for erecting barriers in the ocean to prevent, you know, for example, to prevent warm water from melting Arctic ice. Uh, I'm, I'm just kind of brainstorming here, right? But the idea is we come up with, with a, an, ex, you know, an exhaustive list of all these resources, and then we look, we, we manually look for ways to connect resources to ways uh, of, of, of cooling the planet. But then we also use Amy, the third ingredient of radical collective intelligence, to, su to suggest connections, right? 
So anyway, let me, I've done enough screen sharing for the moment, <laughs> uh, but just to recap, um, we're looking at, um, you know, how do we use the three ingredients of radical collective intelligence to solve the problem of cooling planet Earth, having already looked at it for using collective intelligence to end hunger. So uh, anyway, this is all part of an introduction we're, we're giving to radical collective intelligence with those two main areas of focus to say, hey, look, why don't we use radical collective intelligence to solve these two kind of burning problems first, hunger and cooling the planet. Um, and both as very much emergency steps, you know, why is hunger such an emergency step? Because if we don't start to solve the problems of inequality and, and poverty and extreme poverty, including um, all the whole refugee crisis and everything, um, all the organized crime that's, that's driving so many people to poverty, um, we are, you know, we're, we're right at the verge of revolution in many countries. And these revolutions could cause wars between countries. And we could precipitate the collapse of civilization um, before it really needs to collapse. And, you know, one of the uh, negative consequences of, of, of civilization collapsing um, is that we would lose the reflectivity effect of all the particulates that are being emitted um, by all of the... Um, you know, industries and coal burning power plants and vehicles and whatnot, you know, and you, and at first you might think, well, hey, wait a second, the emission of particulates, that's a bad thing. And it'd be a good thing to stop that. In general, yes, I would agree. But there's a very important reality that we need to look at, which um, is that all these particulates that we're spewing into the atmosphere and that slowly fall to the ground, since we're constantly spewing them into the atmosphere, there's always a healthy an unhealthy inventory of them in the atmosphere. And there's so much of it in the atmosphere at any given time that it reflects away so much sunlight that it's essentially artificially keeping the planet at least two and a half degrees centigrade cooler than it would otherwise be. Maybe three centigrade, three degrees centigrade cooler or even more, um, depending on which study you look at. But it's somewhere in that range, meaning that... Um, if we have a collapse of civilization, boom, we'll have an instant spike of two and a half to three degrees C just from that. So um, it's very important that we prevent collapse of civilization right now. Buy us some time, just like it's very important that we refreeze the Arctic um, so that we don't have that other spike in temperature that we'd get from losing the, the Arctic mirror that reflects away sunlight. See, it's all about keeping the sunlight away and not losing those mirrors that are currently reflecting the sunlight away until we have until we come up with a with a a, a powerful enough uh, substitute to those mirrors. So we got to keep the mirrors in place, you know. Keep the keep the plates spinning, uh, whatever. Choose your metaphor, and um, uh, we've got a lot of resources that we can deploy to do that. We need to use collective intelligence. A radical collective intelligence to make all the connections between the resources that we have and the possibilities that may that exist um, to cool the planet. I mean, it's it's as simple as that. So, um, and I argue we need to end hunger for this for for the reason that we need to keep civilization going, <laughs> right? If we if we suddenly have a program to end hunger and it's not that expensive, it's totally achievable. I've talked with with Bill Gates about it, and he kind of blew me off um, because. For him to address hunger would would beg the question, why don't you cut a check, right? Um, he could literally uh, end hunger tomorrow with his own money, literally. Now, he wouldn't be able to end it forever, but he'd be able to take out hunger for like a two-year period just with his own funds. Uh, he chooses not to do that. Uh, he chooses to hoard the money instead. And therein lies, you know, 90% of the problem, hoarding, uh, depriving the masses of vital resources keeping the masses in abject poverty, causing them to over reproduce. And that's, that's the population, you know, um, predicament in a nutshell. But anyway, but um, not to pick on Bill Gates in particular, uh, but we have um, 
we we have a solution for that that we articulated you know about an hour ago um it's one possible solution there i'm sure there are others but one way or another we need to end hunger we need to keep civilization going in the short term so that we can build out the solutions that we need to cool the planet build out our ecologies i'm just kind of on my soapbox here <laughs> but this is kind of how i see it and this is why it's so darn crucial that we deploy collective intelligence now so that we can make the ending of hunger a reality you know come up with all the solutions that we need to really you know to to end hunger on all the solutions that we need to cool the planet buy us some time and in that time we'll evolve the radical collective intelligence platforms to such a level that now they'll be generating just streams of brilliant solutions to address all the world's most daunting problems is there a guarantee that radical collective intelligence is going to solve our problems? No, but it's sure worth giving it a try. And with that, I'm going to get off my soapbox. I'm going to go on mute and I'm going to encourage you gentlemen to say whatever you have to say about this, uh, specifically about radical collective intelligence, uh, using it to end hunger and using it to cool the planet for starters. And then we can expand from there. Mike, did you want to go ahead? Okay, I'll uh, I'll jump in here, Jamie. I really like what you've put together, the uh, thought process, uh, the way you uh, have started it out saying, okay, we need to get these conversations going. Then Tim, transcription index mapping, taxonomies, and then bringing uh, the power of artificial intelligence into it to manage it and to share it out. Um, that's really important because, uh, it, as we said previously, as Ralph Nader encourages, these changes, whatever they are, whether they're the social, spiritual changes uh, for the wholeness of people or the, the needs of, of food, water, and air for both the ecosystem and ourselves, uh, to preserve them and to share them and to further uh, increase them, that it begins with a conversation. So uh, the platform here, what we have today, is about getting people to start talking about these ideas. So as you were talking about, well, how do we cool the planet, and you showed or talked about some ideas like thin films, you know, just as you're talking about that, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, thin films. Um, you know, it's it, if you, I have an old mirror just around the corner, it's just sitting there on the floor doing nothing. It's a full length mirror that you'd hang on your wall. And uh, that's just glass with a, a, a thin film of silver reflective paint. Um, and that mirror, one of the things that we should think about is that, uh, and I saw this on a television program, I forget what it's called, The you know, the two guys that do experiments, Mythbusters, Mythbusters, I think. And there's an episode where they show the power of just a simple everyday mirror, such as I have around the corner, sitting there doing nothing, and they, they collected they basically make a wall very much like what's behind me it's not it wasn't it was maybe three times the size of that and they focused mirrors on that wall to a point and they burn holes through well they start with a, a la old laptop they burn a hole through that in short order then they actually hold up a meat cleaver, a steel, stainless steel meat cleaver, and they burn a hole through that. So, and it wasn't a very large wall, but um, yeah. you know, this might not be as difficult as we think. You know, the, yeah, the, you, you make a really good point. I mean, the, the, there is so much power. It, it, the sunlight is so easily directed and redirected absorbed, used to generate electricity, reflected back into space. 
you know, th this is very much a problem of managing radiation, managing light, managing photons. We can reflect them, we can absorb them, we can deflect them, um, we can use them for photosynthesis, um, which sequesters carbon. We can use that, you know, anyway, on and on and on. Now, what I like about what you're suggesting, Miles, is we might be able to use the sunlight in kind of a jujitsu move. Now, just imagine, we concentrate the sunlight on, say, water and boil it, right? And the boiling water creates all this steam, which then up above condenses into droplets, creating clouds, and that those clouds are a mirror. Not a perfect mirror, but a, but a pretty darn good mirror for reflecting the sunlight back into space because the sunlight sees white droplets, which have shiny surfaces, and they, they get reflected back into space. When I was a graduate student at, at MIT, I proposed an idea for how we could address droughts and increase photosynthesis, um, photosynthetic activity, by using the tidal action of seawater in you know places like the you know Arabian Peninsula where there's vast deserts. Using that tidal action with mechanic with giant mechanical systems, probably made of concrete. Um, that would pump, 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 ratchet and pump, and then use gravity to channel the water to the middle of the desert, where it could then get spread out, eat, use the sunlight to evaporate it, create clouds, reflect, reflect sunlight back into space, and then those clouds would go somewhere and, and basically take a piss and you know precipitate and rain, you know, driving vegetation, which then sequesters carbon, yada, yada. And of course, vegetative covered uh, land mass, you know, has entirely different characteristics of reflectivity and whatnot than does sand, than does water, right? So there's all kinds of levers that we can use the sunlight to, you know, for like, like I'm saying, like a jujitsu move, use it, its power against it, you know, and ultimately send it back into space <laughs> through all these different mechanisms. Anyway, go on unmute. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, um, one of the things that we have to really ask ourselves, and this is where we, you and I had a little bit of an exchange on, on uh, the comment boxes uh, with respect to my suggestion that I made that maybe we'd like to call it radical collective moral intelligence. And I just say that because it is very critical that we move forward in a spirit of truth. So when I say moral, um, I'm not, I don't want anybody to think that this is ever to be some sort of a cult, but that we do need to think about moral and in particular truth. Um, not to go into it into a lot of detail at this time, but uh, I passed a, a link to you from a uh, website or from YouTube, and I'm just going to show it to you right now to talk about um, well, this. It's just going through an ad here. I got to skip it. But okay, so this gentleman here is a, a gentleman called Jordan B. Peterson, and he's a psychologist from the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Peterson is is becoming quite famous, maybe infamous too, because not everybody agrees with him. But he, in, in this particular episode from 2015, he talks about how the fact is that, that philosophically truth doesn't exist unless it's accompanied by an action. And it occurred to me listening to that, um, again, the concept of our passivity uh, is going to be our downfall, according to Sheldon Woolen. We have to get people doing what we're doing right now, talking and asking questions and really, you know, sometimes even asking, is there, are there other ulterior motives 
that exist that uh, you know are subverting the truth that maybe these issues are not that difficult to solve. You know, you said, for example, uh, I've heard it as well. You you took if you took six hundred billion dollars, you and maybe it's not even that much because. Uh, suggested Bill Gates can solve world hunger, but, you know, nevertheless, uh, compared to military spending, we could easily feed everybody. So with, with 50, sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but with $50 billion per year, we could end world hunger. Back to you, Miles. Okay, $50 billion. You know, that's a, that's a drop in the bucket, right, with respect to budgets for spending on other things. And and so that that's an example right there that I what I just said, that some of these problems are maybe not so difficult. Um, and we're talking about how you know, easily uh, solar energy can be concentrated with a simple, simple everyday mirrors. Like there is nothing special about what I just described, the, the myth busters where they start burning holes through all sorts of pro uh, items. Uh, and indeed, the whole concept of why we are we're ever using as much fossil fuel to begin with has to be asked because going back to solar, you know, technologies exist. In fact, for 100,000 years that we've used as human beings to use solar. Um, uh, some friends of ours that uh, we have down in Wyoming, their particular home has a, a, a large wall of glass on one side that faces towards the, the sun. And uh, in the hall, it's a wall of rock. And it's just passive solar heating. The sun shines through the glass, warms up the rock. That warms their house to a considerable degree. So again, hmm, you know, it, it, like I'm here in Calgary, and sometimes I've for many years now, I've, especially in wintertime, you drive around, and you can see the the steam coming out of the uh, the uh, flues, the stacks on uh, from people's furnaces, and you can see how much natural gas is being burned. And at the same time, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe maybe we wouldn't be burning as much natural gas if we just had a little bit more insulation in all these homes. But then again, well, who designed the building code and uh, whoever comes up with the building code and establishes what we should have for insulation, are they in any way in cahoots with uh, the gas company, right? The natural gas company. Anyway, so I'm just, I'm just kind of babbling here, but if you're getting the idea about um, asking questions, I hope that's what it's sort of conveying because um, I don't know who said it, it's not all that difficult. Ask questions, get answers. You know, it's a no-brainer. The thing is, we as people are too passive. We need to start asking questions. And when I present to ideas, I don't want people to even think that I'm necessarily endorsing it. Don't, you know, I will quick, I'm going to, going forward, always quickly jump on people if they start to think, oh, well, you're, you're, you're left or you're right. No, I'm just looking for answers. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to say that this person said that. Like, for example, this Jordan Peterson, this psychologist, I don't agree with everything he says, but there are some people that if you critique Jordan B. Peterson, uh, they'll jump on you like, because I don't know, for some reason, we tend to elevate people as gods. You know, maybe it's our, maybe it's that, need to try to have some sort of a spiritual leader or something inside of us that is lacking. But anyway, um, uh, the thing is that you can learn a lot of people or a lot from a wide variety of people. So, for example, one of the things I disagree with Jordan Peterson is he's really anti-Marxist. And I'm not a Marxist either, but he calls them murderous Marxists. And I've, as I said in a previous scope, I have listened to some professors talking about Karl Marx, and he seems to have um, some pretty good ideas about, 
you know, what's going on in the economy and how you have a ruling class and then you have the working class. And, you know, if this ruling class is, is uh, you know, 12 people at the top of the pyramid at Amazon, let's say, who are calling all the shots, well, yeah, that's going to have quite a profound effect on the shape of the economy. If there is just indeed a ruling class and a massive worker class. So that's where I don't jump all over Karl Marx, but I don't want anybody calling me a communist because I'll tell you, no, I'm a capitalist. I just is, I'm just more into sharing capitalism. So um, with that in mind, um, you know, as I said the other day that I invited Paul Hellyer, a former minister of defense to join in on one of these hangouts, an amazing man. He's only, well, he's 93 years old. And he replied to me, he said, Miles, sorry, I'm really busy working on my manuscript. Uh, I want to get my book, next book out uh, this May. It's called Restoring Hope. So I, I, I'm definitely going to read that one. But why bring him up again is he's controversial. Like I, this guy really believes there's extraterrestrials. He believes that uh, the United States actually shot down a, a, a spacecraft. He says things like he's concerned that we'll upset if we start shooting down their spacecrafts that we're going to actually have an, another enemy to worry about, let alone the Russians kind of thing. Um, so anyway, I, I think that's like, woo, that's way out there. But at the same time, this man is uh, is really brilliant. Like you do have to read his books uh, about uh, um, the economy, money management, the Federal Reserve and all these issues uh, that you know, I'm not an expert on, but he talks very intelligently about but one of the things that, the reason i'm bringing him up again is that he talks about how uh in world war ii when we were under threat it was it was basically a stroke of the pen and all the factories that were making washing machines uh automobiles uh, refrigerators all of these plants uh, smelters they were converted basically overnight to 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 the war effort right and that's what we need to do here we need to uh, create a peace project out of out of making these solar panels um you, you, diverting you know again as you were talking i was thinking about how we uh, every year there's the hundreds of thousands of square miles. I've got a globe here, but uh, so if we look at North America, um, there's just thousands of and thousands, millions of square miles that are are traversed by combines and tractors, no problem, right? So in other, in other words, we have very easily the ability to um, to to use paving machines or harvesting machines to cover large areas very quickly to deploy these thin films or, or you know, maybe there's even reflective plants, who knows, that could be planted, uh, you know, but uh, anyway, to summarize, just we have a, a huge ability to mobilize resources when we want to. So with that, I'll just pause. Yeah, really good points, Miles. We've got so many resources, so many levers for orchestrating the use of those resources. Now, this recording is, this video conference is obviously being recorded and broadcast, and one day soon will be transcribed to text. Now, you can imagine of all the things that you said, um, the words that you said, the concepts that you're talking about, now imagine them being automatically mapped through Tim to uh, taxonomies of problems and of solutions and of ways of uh, solving certain problems. 
And then you could also then imagine uh, Amy, the third ingredient of radical collective intelligence, connecting you to other people based on the things that you're talking about, Miles. I mean, it's real. It's this is really simple stuff. See, radical collective intelligence. Um, <laughs> it, yes, it is radical in that it gets to the root of the world's problems, but it's not that complex. That's one of the amazing things about it. Now, it uses complex AI technology like transcription that uh, but at its but in terms of describing what it actually does it's not that complex it uses the artificial intelligence for what it's good for which is pattern recognition um and you know catalog ca cataloging and organizing large amounts of data um but it uses human beings for what we're best for which is getting together and using our collective intelligence our group genius to come up with much better ideas than any of, us, any of us could do alone. Combine those two capabilities together, artificial intelligence and collective human intelligence, and that's what creates radical collective intelligence, and that's what we believe is this massive untapped power, the source for generating uh, great solutions like what we've been talking about. All right, um, well, speaking of solutions, I need to solve, the, the problem that uh, um, I need to get some sleep. <laughs> it's twelve <laughs> in the morning. Sounds yeah. like bad to sleep, Miles. I still need to get to sleep, and uh, I just want to check in. Michael, are you there? Or, or I know Michael had to step away a little bit ago, so maybe he's maybe he's not back yet. Yeah, I, uh, I'm glad I was able to pop in here and catch. Uh, this part of it anyway you know and, uh, and just one more thing here that the idea popped into my mind sorry for making so much noise with my paper here with you know um snow machines snow making machines for ski hills uh there there's ski hills all over the place where they cover large areas of of terrain with uh, snow making machines they they pump water and compressed air together and they make snow and uh, for example we have a ski hill just on the west side of calgary that uh, is probably not in the best location so they they make a lot of snow um, and obviously they make it very reasonably priced they've obviously covered the capital cost of putting in the snow making machines and they they cover this very large area um and you know there's the price of a ski ticket is not that high so that's why i'm saying obviously it's not a huge uh, capital cost or even an operating cost so uh, what you were talking about earlier about what we need to do in the arctic um you know maybe we have to make sure to start deploying people up there to when the temperature is favorable that you kick in these snow machines uh, and then you start to uh, making snow and covering the, the land with uh, reflective white snow. Well, you know, actually you gave me an idea that you might be able to use those snow making machines to actually create sort of like temporary floating, um, uh, you know, little barges made of snow. You can imagine using uh, a thin film, <coughs> um, you know, water barrier at the bottom, creating snow machine, using snow machines to, to cover them with snow and then setting them adrift. So they become these floating mirrors, right? I'm just thinking of a simple way of doing it. Maybe there's a much better way of doing it, but the snow has, has the benefits that it's, it's buoyant and reflective. Well, and the other thing to think about as well is at the ski hill, uh, the, the reason they can make big, big piles of snow is because they do it on the cold days. When the temperature is a bit warm, of course, they don't make snow. But the, the thing is, it's in their power to make snow whenever it's cold, as opposed to if they just sat around waiting for Mother Nature, it requires the combination of the cold temperatures and then, you know, a warm front bumping into a cold front, a certain atmospheric conditions have to happen at the same time, whereas we have the ability to just, uh, just oh, hey, it's a good, nice, cold day. It's, 
you know, 10 minus 10 degrees Celsius, uh, let's fire up the snow machine. And then, you know, during the, they, so they can have dry, sunny days, but they're cold and uh, yet they can make oodles, noodles of amounts of snow. So, you know, and there's people that need jobs, right? So you create factories that start making this equipment and then you have people, um, there's in, uh, it's interesting in Northern Canada, they created a, a new territory. It's called Nunavut. It's a, it's a huge area, formerly part of the what's called the Northwest Territories. There's only 20,000 people live up there in this huge area. Um, but nevertheless, you know, they need jobs, especially with the, there being the Inuit people. Uh, if indeed, as it's being reported, the polar bears are suffering and, and you know, then that affects everything else, seals and such. Uh, they get their meat from, their sustenance from seals. Well, you know, here's an opportunity for them to um, earn a living by uh, making snow up there. Anyway, well, um, you want to check out. So um, I just uh, really, again, appreciate joining in on the conversation. Well, we sure appreciate having you, Miles. Really great points. And, and again, a great example of collective intelligence in action since this is being recorded. Michael, welcome back. All right, we're getting ready to sign off. Michael, do you have any anything else you'd like to talk about or add or question or comment on? Uh, only that this is not going to be the last uh, brainstorming session we do uh, uh, on the introduction to, you know, radical collective intelligence. So please, uh, you know, join us for the next one. If, if you can reach out to us ahead of time to, you know, know when we may be doing that. So you don't just kind of have to wait around and you know, see whether we're online or not. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up, Michael, because actually what we're going to be doing in the next 24 hours is actually mapping out a schedule. And um, so, in fact, after we sign off here, um, if you guys want to stick around, um, we can even talk scheduling for just very, very briefly, just generally. Um, so, uh, and then we'll post that schedule on radish.org on the homepage, and uh, people will know what the schedule is, and we'll have the links right there. Um, ultimately, that'll become a calendar function on Radish. You know, these are just basic building blocks of radical collective intelligence that we're building out. And, you know, part of the importance of communicating all this to the world is we need, we need help. We need help in building out the radical collective intelligence to solve all these problems to the extent that they can be solved. I thought it was on in the snow. Check it out. Yeah, I thought it would be fun to uh, show you, you know, uh, Thailand uh, contrasted to where I am right now here in uh, snowy Calgary, Alberta. Uh, we'd kind of, it would be nice to actually be sitting having a coffee on a patio, but I'm not going to stay out here too long. But <laughs> it's, a, it's a frosty day up here. Yeah, well, I used to live in uh, Edmonton, so I, I know what, what that was like. Oh, very good. Great. What did you... Uh, did you were you born up there? Or? No, no, I just uh, spent uh, maybe half a year up there, including uh, during the winter. Okay, oh, very good. Well, then, uh, you, yeah, Calgary's not uh, nearly well. It, it's it's pretty cold too, but Edmonton's definitely colder. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Um, well, anyway, yeah. So let's uh, let's work. Yeah, well, on let's that. let's keep yeah. it that way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Keep it cold. Keep yeah. it cold. Anyway, okay. Right. Well, let's uh, let's wrap and move on to the uh, scheduling. Very good. All right. Well, let me let me just thank everyone. So when I hang up, you guys don't need to hang. I mean, I'm not going to just nobody hang up, but I'll just end the broadcast and thank our viewers who are watching live. Thank you all for watching, and please join us in the future. And also, please. Feel free to jump in to these conversations whenever you feel like it, just as Miles did. Go look for the video that we posted about 26, 27 hours ago on this very YouTube channel called uh, something like Instructions for How to 
join a video conference in progress. And then we also post them in the description of that video. We post, that's where we're posting them now. We will be posting them on radish.org soon. Thank you both again, Michael and Miles, and thanks to our audience. And uh, feel free to post your questions or comments in the comments area of this YouTube video. Thanks everyone so much. We'll see you next time. Thank you.